your alternative talk radio contact, the planet, KGRARadio.com. With infinite complacency, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Welcome to another edition of Into the Fray. If you haven't seen the announcements online, the heavily expanded and updated second edition of Somewhere in the Skies, A Human Approach to the UFO Phenomenon has been released. And it has already hit number one in three different categories on Amazon. Its expansion includes follow-ups with most of the interviewees, brand new chapters and encounters, chats with scientists and researchers, and even an entire chapter with Kevin Day, radar operator and the first person to witness, track, and intercept the Tic Tac UFO. You can get your copy on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Wanted to say a big thank you to those who helped get Beyond the Fray Bigfoot to 100 reviews on Amazon. Cody, Leslie, Troy, Jamie, John Olson of the Stranger Bridgerland series, Ash, Froho, and Eric. Thank you guys so much. Doesn't mean that we don't need more reviews for Beyond the Fray Bigfoot, but now let's see what we can get for Beyond the Fray Paramalgamation. So please head on over to Amazon and leave your rating and review if you enjoy the books. A big hello and welcome to my new patrons over at Patreon.com. Michelle, Lori, Troy, aka Tony, Ron, Graham, Sticky Sound Zine, which by the way, has an awesome Etsy shop, so make sure to check that out. Look in the show notes for it, I'll put the link there. Jack, Samantha, Reed, Chad, Crystal, Tyler, and Richard. Welcome to Patreon, guys. Also, on top of what you guys see at Patreon.com, as far as the rewards, I also recently added a private Discord channel for us. That is for patrons only. And we've been having quite a bit of fun with it. We've been chatting there every day, and I am learning as I go, because I am new to Discord. But it's it's an awful lot of fun. So, head to Patreon and search Into the Fray to check out the various pledge levels and their rewards. And now, to my talk with author B.A. Crisp. Um, well, my name is B.A. Crisp, and uh, later in life I was prompted or I felt compelled actually to write a book um, loosely based on some of the events that I experienced in northern Ohio when I was raised as a as a foster child. Um, the book is entitled Red Bird uh, and um, there were a few things that happened and I need to give um, your listeners a little bit of background. So um in Ohio, I, I was born um, in Sandusky, Ohio, which is up by Lake Erie, uh, and I was remanded as a ward of the court. I, I grew up as a, a for a good part of my childhood as a foster child, so I was in foster care, ward of the court, and um, uh, and eventually I went to live on a pretty remote farm um, outside of Perkins Township, um, and a lot of weird going ons. Uh, happened uh, from the time I was nine years old all, all the way up until I left the area at the age of 16. Some of those things were highly unexplainable, um, and they were also things that I didn't revisit until many decades later. But this area, I discovered, um, was actually, uh, there was a certain part of it where in 1941, the U.S. government's land agents took possession of 44 million acres of land 
um, which is like roughly the size of the New England states. Mm. And in my home county, which is Erie County, the government exercised eminent domain and forced 150 Ohio farm families, some of which had had um, those lands since the firelanders first came to the area. They took 9,000 or 10,000 acres of land. Oh, now, why? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So and people tried to fight it to no avail. And it became the um, the Plumbrook Ordnance Works and later uh, NASA Plumbrook Station. So uh, I remember going, we had an amusement park out there. A lot of people uh, may know the amusement park of Cedar Point, which is right on the lake. And when you drove along Route 250 on your way, if you, if you were headed towards Cedar Point, uh, I believe north, uh, you'd look to your left and you could see a black or a red and white checkered dome, but that's about all. It may be a stack there. I think there was a smokestack and that's all you could really see because it was just surrounded by cornfields and woods. And I was always curious about the place. Um, and, uh, uh, fast forward a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm growing up and managing my childhood. Um, uh, my grandfather, I found out was later a subcontractor, an electrical subcontractor on the building or on part of NASA Plumbrook farm. I'm not exactly sure what he did. Um, you know, he, he died a long time ago. Uh, but I did find, find that out. So as I'm, as a ward of the court, I'm eventually taken to this farm and it was called Mapledale farm at the time. And it's pretty remote. Um, and, uh, the book red bird is loosely, very loosely based on, on the story, but I was seeking answers to a lot of questions. Um, so I, I was, uh, my father was awarded custody and he later turned out to be not my father at all. I had an entirely new family oh that I that I only recently discovered through Ancestry.com, and they actually found me. Um, so we're up to eight siblings total so far. Wow. And wow. I, my father used to he my my father who would have been a hundred years old. He, he was a lot older than my mother, and we all had different mothers, so we're all half siblings. Um, he, he spent four years in France during the army in world war II working in intelligence, which I thought was, was pretty cool. But, but we go back to the farm. I'm about the sighting that we saw. I was about 12 years old. Um, and we were on a, I do remember the old jungle gyms that were, you know, you'd put up and they had monkey bars and swings and they were like mini playgrounds back in the, I'm dating myself, but back in the uh, early 80s, it was like 79 or 80, I think, um, the summer of 79 or 80. And I know we were on summer break. So we're sitting outside in the evening. It's my brother and two other friends. And I still remember who they are, but I won't, I won't out them. <laughs> um, uh, and we're, sitting under the jungle gym and I'm, I was a pretty bossy kid. So, um, we're trying to do two finger pickup in a, in a seance, if you will. And we, I, one lady is, or one girl is on the grass and we've got our two fingers under her and we're going to, our plan is to levitate her. So I, I my job w was to look around and make sure that my brother and my other friend were fully focused on this. <laughs> you know, what's so funny is that I have played that game. Uh, we called it, uh, I like the two finger pickup. That's exactly what it would be. Uh, but we called it light as a feather, stiff as a board. Uh, but uh, I, re I recall very vividly play trying to play that game as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we weren't having much luck, um, um, lifting Monica, I'll, I'll say her name. I won't give her last name, lifting Monica off the ground. <laughs> and, um, out of the, my eye, so I'm facing toward this country road and it goes up an incline, a small incline. And on the, if you're looking at the road to the right side of the road is a field, there's our yard and we had a strawberry patch. We had a tree in the, in the corner that met the, it was, it was right where the, the boundary line to the uh, field and the road and our yard where it all met. And, 
there was cornfield and then woods. So it was sort of this rolling and then it went up this incline. So as I'm looking, I could see the top of the road, um, which was the reed house and where that was located. And I see someone bobbing, bipedaling and bobbing up over the hill. And I thought, oh, somebody's walking. Not unusual back then. Um, and I'm a kid, so I'm, I'm, I'm watching and I, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, somebody's walking. Well, as this thing gets closer and closer, we had a, we also had a security light next to the tree, a big yard security light. And this thing gets closer and it reaches the border of where the yard and the field and the road is located. And I realized it wasn't human. It was so tall. And it was white, which shocked me. And I thought, what is this thing? I, I don't even know what this thing is. I, my 12-year-old my brain could make no sense of it. And But you try to fill in gaps. You try to figure out. Um, you're trying to make sense of it. And, I, and I'm thinking that. And my, I remember my gut instinct was like, that's not human. And, and that's way too tall to be a human. And is that can't be, is that a polar? That's not a polar bear. So all these thoughts are going through my head and I suddenly scream, Oh my God. And I remember I said, Oh my God, what's that? And the other friend sat up, Monica sat up, the other friend and my brother, we all looked at the road and this thing turned, it like twisted its torso and it galloped on all fours it was no longer bipedaling. It galloped on all fours and shot into that field. And of course we raced to the house. We had no, and I saw the fur, you know, I saw a gl this glimpse of like fur and, and I thought there's no human being that runs like that. So we still to this day don't know what they saw, what we saw. Um, I always try to find in a more earthly explanation for that, um, whether it's a government related type of, you know, epigenetic program. I don't know. Um, is it something, some um, zoological species that we haven't been able to find? Who knows? Um, but I do remember, you know, we tried to fight for the screen door to get in. We were so scared. Um, I told the man that I thought was my dad and he's like, oh, you kids are crazy and really sort of scoffed it off and laughed at us and whatnot. But but um, uh, I remember a couple of days later, we had, the, you know, the trucks with the um, military uh, in, the, in the back. Of the, they were all sitting in the back. All the soldiers were in the back of this, this big Jeep thing where they were, I don't know what they call it. But, but uh, I remember going by and I remember locking eyes with one of the soldiers. And, and I'm thinking, why are they out here? What are they doing out here? And I wonder now in retrospect, were they... Were they looking for that thing? I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but it's a it's a weird facility because there have been, if you Google Ohio and Lake Erie, there have been unexplainable lights. Uh, there have been other quote Bigfoot sightings, um, and then I think that I had a bit of vindication when I mentioned um, this episode. Years later, there was a, another gentleman uh, from my hometown, and he said, oh, my gosh. And, and they lived uh, probably two miles away from where I was at the time. And he said, before my mom died, she told my dad that she saw a white creature, and she thought it was trying to get into the house. And my little, she and my little brother were there, and he was a baby at the time. And she was so scared, and he, they all dismissed it. And years later, after she died from breast cancer, they they had ha, they had a fireplace that was built out of railroad ties, the mantle, and wedged between that mantle was a letter she had written about that night and how she thought that this white creature might harm her. And she was writing the letter that if anything happens to me, um, and she must have later uh, stuck that letter there. Mm. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, and and then we had another incident where. My foster mother just started screaming. I was upstairs. It was at night. She was readying for bed, and she started screaming. And she, she, we, and the sheriff was called. He came out. They found nothing. Um, 
and you know, and she was pretty shaken. And my, my, again, my dad ran outside with a gun and couldn't see anything. And later she had told me, um, and this is a pretty reserved, um, and sensible woman. You know, she later told me she confided later. She said, all I know is it had really red eyes and I don't think it was human. I mean, you've already hit on a lot of the the questions that I was going to ask you. So high five on that one, um, especially the the other sightings in the area was a big one uh, because of the fact that it's a white haired creature. It tends to stand out a little bit more, of course. So, um, and, oh, go ahead. And what I will, well, what I will say is in the winter we had, you know, it was, you know, we had the blizzard of 78 up there. And I remember as a kid, I learned how to ride a John Deere, John Deere snowmobile. In fact, I rode one that was way too big for me, but that's what we did. We'd go into town on the snowmobile in the winter to get, because it's lake effect snow. So in the winter, sometimes when you were in that rural environment, it was the only way to get around. So I'd be sent to the store to get bread or sent across the field to the dairy farm to pick up a gallon of milk or two and bring it back on the snowmobile. And that was how we lived. So I often thought, well, what a great thing for a white creature to be able to hide in the winter, maybe not so well in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. That I, I can tell you, I don't miss that lake effect snow. So um, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. stuff that they could never predict. And it always dumps really hard when it tends to, uh, to decide to do so. So your, your brother, something that was kind of mentioned in the email was to this day, he still will not discuss this incident. He won't. So I have to preface all this by saying that my mother was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. She was diagnosed very early and um, uh, she had, my grandmother always doubted the diagnosis. So my mother was a pretty wild and rebellious young lady back in the late fifties, early sixties. And when she was 16 years old, um, she decided to go joyriding in a car in which she did not have permission to drive and she had no license. So she was pulled over by a police officer and he, as he, she waited, she was watching him. The story goes that she was watching him approach in the side view mirror. And as soon as he got up to the car door, she took off and a, a police chase ensued. And before it was done, she had taken down a bunch of fence line and was unconscious. Mm. So she spent a few days in a coma. And my grandmother thinks that she really had a frontal lobe injury, that an undiagnosed frontal head injury that uh, w- was never appropriately treated. But after that, my she says, and I, I wasn't born at this time, um, that she seemed to do okay. Uh, and then later, she had a um, she had an episode where she started to see things or hear things. So my brother was like, you cannot, you can't tell the story because everyone will think we're crazy. And I don't, I'm disassociating myself Mm -hmm. from that. So I gave that a lot of thought and I, I said, you know, he's right. And we let it go for decades. So as I aged, I was like, you know what? I graduated at the top of my class at George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Man- Management as their co-valedictorian. I've attended Oxford at Exeter College. I went to the London School of Journalism. Um, I've passed my psychological evaluations to which I was subjected as a ward of the court. And, and, and in fact, that led to my um, emancipation as a minor um, from, from the court system. But you know, I, I thought, I, I think it's time to tell this story. I, I'm still ser- searching for answers. And I know that there are people that still reside in my hometown who want nothing to do with this or it's kind of leave it alone. I know that the nuclear reactor testing facility was abruptly decommissioned in the early 1970s. And they practically jumped the fences and they left every pen, every coffee cup, every pair of glasses. It's like, it was like walking into a time warp. And just recently there is a defense contracting firm known as Sierra Lobo who has put poured millions into the facility, which by the way is still allegedly run by the army. So, and I think that's about, Without looking up, I have a bunch of notes, but 
but uh, I, I'm curious about it. They say they worked on propulsion systems, um, and I have a feeling there was much more uh, going on than that. I um, love those secretive places like that. What's the thought behind them leaving in the manner that they did? Like you said, they, they left the pins, the chairs, the everything behind. Well, I think that they had an accident. And I don't think that the public was privy to that accident. I think there was some sort of nuclear, I wouldn't call it fallout, but I think that they, that there was some contamination with the water. I think that they had a leak. I think it was all covered up. And I know for a fact that I lost at least two former classmates or people that were close to me in age. One I babysat for, he was actually a lot younger. Um, you know, Nick died as a senior of a weird cancer, a lot of leukemias. Um, mm. and I know the Brad died too, very young as cancer. And I lost a, uh, there was another, she wasn't a classmate. She was two years older than I was and she died too. So I, you know, my graduating class at this school would have been about 67 or 68. I ended up graduating at a different school further South, um, because I left the area at 16, but, but, um, you know, I just, I always thought that was, mm. I always thought that was really curious. Um, so almost like a Flint, Michigan type of a situation going on there. Almost. I mean, I, you know, I don't know for sure. Um, you know, I did, it's funny. I did, I did actually meet with Aaron Brockovich and we actually did discuss, uh, uh, some of the concerns that I had, but it seems as if from what I understand, uh, the, they're back there. So they must've done one hell of a cleanup effort. And that is my understanding that they also poured a lot of money into cleaning up whatever it was that happened back there. Mm. Yeah, that's terrifying. Especially Which is when, still off. Yeah, and you're you're moving up to a you know what's supposed to be a nice peaceful area, and then you have stuff like that going on, and and come to find out you're just dying every day because of what they're doing, what they're testing or or, or playing with. Yeah, and then I got caught. They, <laughs> I remember. So I was dared as a teenager and we'd been drinking. I know that surprises you, but <laughs> <laughs> I am shocked. <laughs> but, uh, we had this little campfire and, and I said, you know, cause I used to, I was out in the woods all the time. I loved to read and I loved to be out in the woods and I would just traipse all through there. And I had a pet squirrel and I had a pet raccoon and, you know, I would just constantly try to save all these animals. But I, so I remember I found a, hole in their fence like somebody had cut it like they somebody had gone through there I don't know why I don't know what for so so of course I was like hmm but I was very curious so, I thought. so we were doing the truth or dare which I'm sure you've also played and um someone dared me to go through the fence <laughs> so I did and it took oh my gosh it was I bet it was less than five minutes before there were soldiers with guns and and I was hauled off and they have an FBI office back there or they did they have my they have my name <laughs> so, you're like to I, this day I cannot I cannot misbehave <laughs> yeah right so so I was so I remember this guy was yelling at me about you know I'm trespassing and yeah you know, I could I'm in a I'm in a lot of trouble and and I said well you shouldn't be yelling at me because I found the hole in your damn fence <laughs> so but uh yeah i was pretty i was pretty rebellious and mouthy back then i, I guess mean, like am. that's what uh you know a little bit of underage drinking never never hurt anybody you just happened to traipse in the wrong area that's all no big deal yeah, that's, that's right <laughs> no, no biggie so swinging back to the the sighting of this this white creature how far would you say you were from it and i know what you know you were only 12 it was a long time ago but if you could guess Maybe 200 feet. It was pretty close. Um, the other thing, too, is we used to... Now, you could chalk this up to rats, though, because I always try to find a circumspect explanation for things. But we had a silo, and that is where we would dump our garbage until we loaded it up to take it either to the landfill. But a lot of times with our... We had two silos beside each other, so one... We actually were trying to recycle way back then before it was a big thing. And um, we would put the food without really, we just used it as compost. So we had this compost pile, pile in, in this rotting or in this uh, rusted out 
old corn silo and then we had another silo and we'd store the garbage in there. But it was pretty amazing to me because you'd find all these weird sticks and you'd hear these clicking noises and it always smelled bad back over there, obviously, because you have rotting food. But sometimes that door would be open, like something had gotten in, which was kind of weird. And there was another smell there, too, that we and, – and I always – it would smell like – well, it smelled like garbage, but it was worse. It was like sulfur or rotten eggs. Mm-hmm. And that's – yeah, and that – and, you know, and there would be times out in the woods where you'd get a whiff of that. And I remember kind of traipsing along with my brother, and I'd be like, what is that? You know, and he would always say, well, it's probably an underground well or maybe it's the creek or, you know, something like that. But but I always wondered about that, too. Yeah, that sounds pretty yeah, that familiar. Sounds so when it got on to all fours, you said it was incredibly fast when it went to all fours. And I mean, what was that motion like? Did it look unnatural or, you know, was it just as comfortable on all fours as it was bipedally? It was just as comfortable, and that was weird. So the arms were very long, and when it was coming down the road, it was really swinging those arms. And um, when it twisted its torso and took off, it's almost like it leapt. Its front legs hit, and then it. But when it galloped, it was it was like the the front and the back legs would come together. I don't know if that makes sense, but they came together. It was almost like a horse running, right? And it just. It was like a gallop, and and I remember thinking, I've never seen an animal run like this. Not a bear, and maybe the bears do run like that. But you know, we've thought of everything. Was it an albino bear? But we really didn't have bears there at the time. Certainly wasn't a coyote, and it was bipedaling all the way down the street, almost like a human would walk. And it was so white that you actually thought, oh, what is that, a, pol- a polar bear? Like, that's how white this yeah, thing was. I mean, that's how white it was. We were, I really was, my mind was just trying to focus, and my eyes were trying to focus. My mind was trying to make sense of what I was seeing in my brain. You know, it was yeah. just trying to make sense of what it was seeing. And when you have no reference point, um, you know, it just becomes, it's, it's, it's deeply frightening. Um, but now... It's, it makes me so curious. It makes me so curious that, you know, what was out there? Yeah. Did it ever yeah. look and over the, at you guys? Well, it did. It stopped, you know, it kind of, as soon as I said, oh my God, what's that? It sort of, it stopped as if it were, we surprised it. Like it wasn't expecting us to be out there at night in the yard like we were. And it, it's almost like we startled it. Like my yelling, start, of course, my yelling startled it. <laughs> yeah I mean and then so you run to the house you guys are obviously scared which rightfully so did that change your habits of of the outdoors after that or how you felt about it you know it didn't because as a kid you're pretty resilient and the outdoors was you know it's it's where I spent a lot of time it really didn't I mean I'd have moments where I thought about it but then it was like, you know how you dismiss things later and you go, yeah, maybe I didn't see what I saw because we got a lot of flack from the adults who were saying that yeah, you didn't see what you saw and no, it had to be something else. And, and then you kind of grow relaxed and I didn't see it again. Uh, you know, we would hear stuff, but you, we didn't see it again. So I think, I think uh, I didn't change my habits, maybe for the first few weeks, I don't remember, though. I can really identify with all that stuff, uh, including, yeah, you are resilient. You go back out. You're a kid. It's what you want to do is be outside and play. But also something that came up in the email was that your husband thought maybe it was, in fact, a soldier from, uh, you know, the, one of the bases nearby. They had, obviously, you already mentioned they had a lot of stuff going on there. And I really identified with that because that's exactly what my father told me uh, when I told him about the the shadow figures that I had seen in the woods when actually I was 12 Mm -hmm. as well. So I I really could identify with that part of your sighting on both counts. Uh, But to you, there's no way that that was a person, right? Well, when 
you know, I went, I, it took me a long time to tell my husband, um, and I didn't want him to have second thoughts about the woman he married. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, when I did finally confide it to him, um, you know, he said, Oh, and he's, you know, this, you're talking about a man who is extraordinarily logical. Uh, he worked in law enforcement for many years and, and, um, he said, you know, it has to be a guy. It had to be a guy in a ghillie suit. So I was, and then he showed me, you know, pictures of that. And I said, yeah, maybe. And then I said, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, but I never bought that in my heart. Like I never believed it. I kind of went along for a while. And then finally I just looked at him one day and I said, that wasn't a guy in a ghillie suit. I remember what I saw. And it wasn't that. It was not that. There is no human being that could turn like that and gallop that fast across the field into the woods. Just wasn't going to happen in a ghillie suit. Um, and if he's in a ghillie suit, he's probably handling a weapon, too. And I didn't happen to see that at all. So, Yeah, how would he manage that motion? Yeah. And as big as you say it was, it just seems uh, um, a little odd, yeah. to say the least, for that to be a person. So as far as I know that yeah. your brother, which I understand his his thinking after what what your mom had, you know, uh, been diagnosed with. But has he ever, ever said, even just in passing, like, gosh, that was weird what we saw or gosh, I think that was a Bigfoot, you know, all those years ago. Has he ever verbally said anything about the sighting, even just to you? He says he doesn't want to talk about it. And, he, and, he's, yeah. and if it. If, brings it up he's he's gonna deny it and he's like I still have to live here right. um, and he's you know he's got a family and he's pretty conservative and he's done a wonderful you know he's still married to his high school sweetheart and he prides himself on and he is he's a hard-working successful guy uh in construction and he's just kind of blanked on that and I, I and he I think too he's had to come to terms with um, he didn't really have a good or close relationship with our mother. And, and I think he tried to distance himself and also distance his kids from, from that illness. Um, and whether that's, you know, based on his own fears or concerns, I, I don't know, but I do know that he's, he's pretty content and pretty happy. And I don't, I just think he doesn't want the, he doesn't want he or his wife or his children to be faced with the ridicule, especially in a small town. And that's what would happen. And it, we read all the time about stories when people come forth, they're immediately discredited. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the media is a Goliath and, and they will, and, 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 and if there is something going on from a military or technological perspective, that entire complex, you're not going to beat it. You're just not going to beat it. Not as, a, not as a plebeian, is what I always tell my husband. Yeah, it is definitely a, a Goliath that is nearly impossible to fight if it really gets after you. So I'm looking at uh, the cover of Redbird. And by the way, everybody, this is book one of the Quanta Chronicles. And the cover is really cool. So is there, and this may be way off base, I've not read it, at least not yet. Uh, is there some significance as to why the cardinal on the front is not not whole per se. It it almost looks like, you know, the, the wings and the tail are not quite there. Well, that, I think it's really great that you called out the cover. Thank you. So my son Sterling made the cover. Um, and it, the red bird, um, represents a messenger and there's also, I, I wanted the factor of blood. So one of the things that I did a lot of research on was RH negative blood. I'm RH negative. I'm O negative, RH negative. And I did a lot of research on RH negative blood and I found some fascinating things, whether hype or not. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to research both sides of it. And I actually found a scientific study where two scientists were able to strip down the, the blood uh, to, uh, to like an AB or an A or B. Every other blood has like a, a protein on it or a spike and you strip that down, you have basic blood. So RH negative is either something otherworldly is what everything you read out there says, or it's so basic that we were, that this type of blood is actually a precursor cedar, basic blood for all of earth, all, you know, sentient beings on earth. So it was kind of 
cool. And I just wanted that in the cover because there's a part of uh, this, the protagonist's name is Samantha and she has a, she has a special blood and um, she is taken to a remote farm and she starts, she can't remember certain things, but then she starts having memories and her family's gone missing, you know, and her mom is institutionalized. So this is where you get a little bit of this um, loosely based on the truth with this, not with this book, um, which is first in the series. So uh, that's a little bit of the story behind the cover. Very cool cover. I, and I wasn't trying to be distracted while you were chatting, but I just pulled Amazon up and I wanted to comment on that. Very cool. So you're working on uh, on book two then? Yeah, book two is actually almost done. It, it, it uh, Samantha continues her journey as an adult this time. In the first book, um, she's 16. And, you know, she she goes through a lot on, on this farm. And then the second book, she winds up working uh, for the government sector. And she's a young adult. And it takes off from there. I don't want to give too much of it away. Um, but she ends up having to join forces with a private chemical and weapons contractor um, in order to um, to find someone very special to her. And she's constantly looking for her father, too, who went missing in Vietnam. Wow. So you definitely threaded a lot of, of your real life into into the, the, the chronicles here. Uh, there are some real life elements, yes, but it is a fiction book. It's it's kind of a cross between science fiction and that interstitial fiction is what um, someone someone recently told me who read it. Uh, a lot of metaphysical um and science fiction related and, and paranoid or not paranoid phenomena, paranormal phenomena. And, and it was a great process. Sometimes it's sure. paranoid. I, I, I mean, sometimes that can be paranoid. That wasn't a misspeak at all, you know? Um, especially when you're alone at night and, and you just hear strange noises in your house, then it becomes paranoid. <laughs> um, no, but uh, um, BA, do you, and I, this is totally up to you how much, you, you know, you want to share or if there's anything to share. But one of my patrons uh, had a question for you. And you, you kind of hinted at some of this when we first started. But uh, Andrew of Black Triangle Coffee was wondering, was there any supernatural events or high strangeness prior to or after your sighting of this this Bigfoot-like creature? Okay, so both. So a couple of weird things. Um, we were out, in the, my brother and I were out in the yard another summer night and we were just kind of on our stomachs with our, our, you know, heads in our palms. And we, across the street was a conifer, it was a field. It was a just, and this is on the other side of the road. Um, and I guess it would be, it would be looking East. And, uh, this conifer was all by itself. Um, and that plays out in red bird as well. So this conifer, never lost its leaves. Um, and it, it, um, and we didn't really go over there too much cause it was a farm field and it was muddy. And if I did cut across, it was usually in the winter time when it was all covered in snow and I was on a snowmobile. And this was right before, this was like before, I think this was before the incident it was. And we were, um, looking at this tree and all of a sudden these three, beams of light just went ping, ping, ping into this tree. And we both <gasps> and didn't say a word to each other. And again, it was like hauled ass for the, um, for the screen door to the kitchen or went into the mudroom. And um, we were just like, what was that? And we had no explanation for that, but it was just these three. So six beams total, but they just pinged into the side of this tree and it freaked us out. Um, and, I, we went over there. I remember we went over there and there were two under the weeds and stuff like that. He's like, look, and there were two huge concrete slabs mm. and there was like a little hole there. And my, we had to go back to the house and get a light, get a flashlight. And we found stairs that were going down into the ground. And I was like, oh, yes. So I was like, oh, so my foster mom's like, Oh, that's just an old house. They that's an old that's just an old house. There used to be a house over there years ago. Well, mm -hmm. I could find no record of that. But it could be true. And and I'm like, well, why would there be stairs going in the ground? She's like, that's the old cellar. And I'm like, Oh, 
okay, well, why would they put such great big slabs? And she's like, so kids like you didn't get caught down there. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I guess. I I don't know. That's creepy. Yeah. yeah, so I went back. I actually went back um, just about three years ago, two or three years ago. And I wanted some questions uh, answered. And this was after um, my niece, Camille, called me and she said, I think that my mother is your sister. And it turned out to be true. So I flew up there for my sister's 75th birthday at the time. My, a lot of my siblings, with the exception of one, is they're much older than I am. So so I, I go up there and I thought, you know what? Screw it. I'm here. I'm going to Plumbrook. And I tried to get in the back way that I remembered, and that's all closed off now. They still have the restricted area signs, and you and it's almost like in a residential neighborhood now. So you got to like drive through all these houses, but then it's in the back. Well, that was the old entrance, and it's not the old entrance anymore. But they got cameras everywhere. So I'm like, wow, I wonder where the entrance is. So I found it. You had to go right between the cornfields off of that Route 250. And, and you talk about some security. It was like, and my girlfriend, she was so funny. She was sitting in the car, Laura, she's from Ohio. And I made her go on this adventure. And she's like, if something happens, I don't have any part of it. <laughs> and she was totally panicking, wouldn't get out of the car. So I get out of the car. I park the car. I get out. I'm looking around. I can't get in. I mean, this thing is just like Fort Knox. And finally this guy comes out and he is just in full riot gear. And he's like, can I help you? And, and I said, yeah, I was just interested about this place. And do you do tours? <laughs> he's just looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> and, I, and I explained to him, I said, well, my grandfather, um, help build the original uh, here. And it would be really nice. I'm working on a book and I, it would be really great if I could. And he actually gave me the name of an engineer who was running the place. And he said, uh, call this guy and, you know, come back on your birthday, which was, and I was there in July and my <laughs> birthday was just, and I remember thinking it, cause that was like his availability was, he could give me a tour, a private tour in December. And I didn't go back, but I still have his number. And I really want to follow up and do that. And I'm curious to see just if they meant it or if, if they would, you know, if they or if I just right. felt some, some little chintzy tour. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that instead of just hollering at you to get away that you shouldn't be there, he, he actually gave you the guy's number. That was pretty cool. Unless, like you said, it was some kind of a tactic just to get you away. Yeah, right. And he did. And he was he actually turned out very nice. And my and my girlfriend went and get out of the car. And she was just like, oh, she was almost going into a <laughs> fetal position. Um, but it turned out it, it turned out fine. Um, and you can, you know, you I haven't checked it lately, but you can read about um, Sierra Lobo and some of the things that they'd been doing. Um, and it is public knowledge that that um, that Plumbrook Farm or, you know, NASA Plumbrook Farm or Station, as they called it, NASA Plumbrook Station was is still, I believe, in the hands of the Army. I think it did go over to the Air Force. It's been part of the Pentagon. It's kind of jumped around a little bit. But but the um, the public sector in terms of our military is still very much involved with it. So um, that, that conifer tree, was it, you said it was a, a lone standing tree in, in that little area right there? Yeah, it was. So there was a big field across. So we were kind of surrounded, not kind of, we were, we were surrounded by farm fields and in, but then we had woods behind us. So behind our homes, the farmstead was just woods and across the street from, so the how the front of the house faced the road and across that street was just a big farm field. So we, our road, our, our house actually sat on four corners. Um, but across the street was, just a big field with that one lone tree, which when I did go back, um, it wasn't there anymore. So mm. I pulled in the driveway, nobody was around. And I thought, mm, damn, because I wanted to see. So that was when I went to see my sister, I drove out there and um, nobody was there. And all of a sudden this truck pulls in and I'm getting ready to leave. And again, I'm with Laura and this truck pulls in and out pops this guy and he's gorgeous. He's got white hair, blue eyes and his kids. Oh my God. They were like, 
and his wife too, every one of them, whitest hair, bluest eyes and gorgeous and um, really nice people. And they ended up, he was so gracious and he let me go into the barn and he, and I went up to the, the old um, rooster or the old hen coop. He, and then he, I looked over by the tree and there were a bunch of bricks there. It was almost like an oven or something. And I said, what is that? And he said, oh, we found that when we moved in here and we started making some changes. And, and he said, we kind of dug that up. He goes, that wasn't there when you were here. And I said, no, I don't remember that at all, which was kind of weird. So, but I did ask um, the wife, I said, anything weird go on here? And she said, sometimes. Oh. <laughs> and that's as far as I could get her to go. And um, that's as far as I could get her to go. Uh, and I wasn't going to push her um, because they had a baby. Uh, they had just had a baby and she was exhausted. She'd been up all night and she just happened to come home while I was in the middle of this tour with her husband uh, and his, the, their kids and who were great. They would go, we have to show you something. And they'd take my hand and they'd lead me all over the farmstead. Uh, but she had been up all night cause she had just had a baby a few weeks prior who was still in ICU. So she, you know, she, she was exhausted and I didn't press her uh, to talk, Yeah. but we did, I did have an incident. So I went up to my old, bedroom which was upstairs and I stood there for a minute and I just remembered you had asked me if something strange had happened and after I had seen um and this was probably right before I left so I was an older I was probably almost 16 and this was after the white creature but I was in bed one night and I remember I, I woke up because I felt like somebody was in the room um and I looked over at the doorway and there was this figure and it was, it was a figure of a being. It was like a blue light being. It was like a glowing blue light. Wasn't scared a bit. In fact, I felt an overwhelming sense of love and peace. And I remember I looked over and it was enough to make me say, cause I used to call my foster mom, mom. And I, I said, mom. And and then I thought maybe it's my brother. And I said, Ken, and no response. So I, I'm, but I'm not scared at all. And finally, I just got out of bed, went over to the door, waved my hand through the door frame. And I'm like, oh, and I looked over. So my brother's room was across the hall. His door was open. And I thought, oh, BA, you're so silly. That's just that's just the light coming in from the street lamp. And, uh, you know, and I went back to bed. Well, it was when I rolled over and looked back at the doorway, I shivered. And that's when I couldn't sleep because I was like, that's not what I saw. That's not what I saw. <laughs> and, um, and I never forgot that either. Um, and we did have a lot of weird poltergeist type of activity. So we would have things that would disappear and reappear, things that were moved um, noises we would hear. I remember one night I was awakened and it sounded like somebody was turning pages in a magazine or a book hmm. very loudly. And I yelled for them to stop and they stopped and then it would start again. Oh, and gosh. it was strange things like that. Um, another, so we had a big barn and I remember one time, uh, I was walking out to the street and, or out to the barn and all these, leaves started blowing around my feet. It was the fall. I remember it was chilly and these leaves are blowing around my feet. And all of a sudden I heard these hushed whispers like this, like a language. Mm. And, um, and I, I was like, what is that? And I, I heard the voices and I heard people talking and I kept looking around and I saw nothing. And then, you know, that disappeared. Um, another night it was in the evening. We were talking with a neighbor. We were all outside. My foster moms out there, my brother, the neighbor down the, down the, when I say neighbor, you're talking a little ways down the road, but, um, you know, he was coming over and talking and, and then he looked over and he said, Oh, you got in this barn is huge. And, and he said, some, you guys left your barn light on. And I remember Eileen and I looked at each other. She was my foster mom and we looked at each other and we said we didn't even know we had that light 
We didn't even know that light. So it took us about 20 minutes to locate that light switch in the barn, which we didn't even know we had. <laughs> and it lit up the whole barn like a, like a Christmas. Yeah. And if you didn't know it was there, it wouldn't have been you guys that turned it on and left it on. Right. So. Right. Somebody was out there lurking around who knows, but a lot of weird things. And then I know another instance where I was with a bunch of kids from school and, and you know, it's always popular to go out to the cemetery and smoke weed or at least we did. And, um, back then. And I remember same thing. Wind starts blowing, we hear the voices and it's like, we scattered. We're like getting our cars. We leave the cemetery. Um, another night I was with the superintendent's son and a couple of other kids in a car and we came up over a hill and somebody was in a whole hooded outfit and it was like the grim reaper, not quite like that. And they just stood in the street and we're like, Whoa. And he hit the brakes and we were gone. So a lot of weird a lot of weirdness, a lot of high weirdness going on out there. B.A., do you think then that, you know, a place like that or a place like, because it sounds much like something like a Skinwalker Ranch or something, you know, where there's just weird places that a lot of weird shit goes on. And, I mean, do you think that that's just happenstance that the government moved in and bought land or had, you know, these facilities there? That's just happenstance because, you know, there's a lot of open land out there and it's prime for building a massive facility and doing testing or do you think that it is connected somehow well i think it's a little bit of both so i did a lot of research on the history of the area so in peru township uh there's a well and that we used to be a gathering place for native americans they also used to um uh gather at the river which i they used to call it i can't pronounce it uh, now i'll have to get the name for you but but they also used to gather there and they do some sort of meditation like uh, ritual where they it used to it wasn't a place where they settled, where the Iroquois settled. It was a place or the Wyandots and the Iroquois, they didn't settle there, but they came there. They came together to do rituals. Um, the other thing I found um, as I was doing a deep dive Google search was that the area outside of Peru Township, which is right where that eminent where that land was eminent domain, I found stories from the 1800s when the Firelanders were coming in. They dug up bones, but not in Native American bones, but it was, they were sitting up. Mm. The bodies were sitting up and they were very tall. In fact, one was so tall, the guy claimed, and if you look up, they have this all over Ohio where they allegedly found giants. And one man claimed he could use the skeleton as a helmet. It was that big. So um, there, I, I think that, I, I don't know what the reasons were for. I know that the, that, that NASA Plumbrook station originally started as a munitions kind of place where they kept gunpowder and they were making um, artillery and things like that for the war effort. Uh, but then it kind of morphed into something else entirely. And, when I started juxtaposing the history of that entire area, which by anyone's standards on the outside looking in, it seems nondescript. It seems kind of boring. It, it's hardworking, salt of the earth type of people that, you know, God fearing people um, who, you know, they're just, we're, we're not real confrontational people um, being from the Midwest and, we, but we work hard and, when I looked at the history, I was absolutely astounded. So I had another friend from high school tell me, yeah, if you go down this one road, which has now been paved and it was a dirt road when we were kids and there was a mound there and there were trees on the mound. And one time this kid's arm went through and he pulls up shell necklaces. So I'm sure at one time the fields around there probably had some mounds that were covered over. There were also coins, weird coins. Somebody found a weird coin. And I talked to an archaeologist about a weird coin that was found there that almost looked like it wasn't something that we minted. It looked like something from the Roman Empire. Mm. So it's uh, there's something very weird going on there. And I don't know what that is. I don't, I don't have any idea. All I know is I... I, I tried to distance myself from it for many years, went on with my life, and it's only been within the last few years where I've resurrected my my interest because I felt 
brave enough to do it and you know you get in your 50s and you're menopausal and you just don't give a shit what people think <laughs> amen. Um, <laughs> so, amen to so, that no I, yeah you're awesome because I, you actually did do the research you know because a lot of times that is you know the question is well did you do any research on the house or the land that the house sits on and all this and something that it reminded me of is what you were talking about with the iroquois and ir ir and the iridots is uh, and I cannot remember what episode. I will put it in the show notes for everybody. And and BA, if you want, I can send you the link. But I talked to author Patrick Meekin and his book entitled Nightmare in Holmes County. Of course, Holmes County, Ohio. And his house had talking shadow people, you know, lights, uh, uh, phantom figures, poltergeist activity as far as things moving around, you know, stuff going on outside the house, including... Uh, and it is Amish country as well, but he would find really dark stuff in the woods. So, you know, we're talking like basically sacrifice animals and and things drawn in blood and all of this other crazy shit going on in the in, in the woods. And he, it was the same thing. You know, he was trying to do the the history lesson for himself and figure it out. And it was the same exact thing. You have, of course, Native Americans. They were here first doing their thing, and then mm -hmm. the Amish that were out there and of course he has his own op opinions on what some of the Amish folks are, are into, which he blatantly basically says is a type of witchcraft. So it oh. is so interesting as far as it has nothing to do with you really, except for you happen to be in that spot, either living there or working there or whatever the case might be. And you're just kind of in the middle of all this whole swirl of things going on. So that's that just sorry for the tangent. But that that's what it reminded me of is that chat that I had with Patrick about nearly the exact same things. Yeah, and I think the and I and believe me, I don't mind the tangent. And what I would love is for someone to come forth with and say, oh, well, that was us. And we were doing this, that and the other thing. Yeah. Um, fine. Yeah. That's fine. But, you know, don't don't just scoff and ridicule, you know, people, I, it, there are a lot of people, good, normal, um, as I broadly define that, credible people who have these stories, but because they fear that ridicule, and that, again, that Goliath media, and that was one of the reasons, Shannon, that I was so attracted to the way you present your your stories or the people that you interview, uh, as I watched on the trail of UFOs, which I thought was interesting. I loved the respect that you gave to, to the subjects who interviewed with you. And, and, and I, I was just telling my husband in passing and, and, you know, and he reached out, he, he had the wherewithal to reach out to you. And I'm very glad for that. I am too. And and thank you for being willing to come on and actually talk about this stuff. Because as you said, there are so many other stories and people out there that they probably don't even really know it. But the second they start talking about it, and I know I had this experience, once I finally started to, to get it out, boy, it felt good to do that. And I, I just think it's really it's, important to, to try to cultivate as much information as we can. It does. And, and any good scientist, you know, or any, you know, there, the, the science and the sacred as we're discovering through the study of quantum physics, um, and, and even things like Tibetan Buddhism or yeah, meditation or, or raising your consciousness, however you wanted to find that, you know, the, the science and the sacred are coming together. And what we think of as magic you know, or magical or even supernatural may not be, may not be. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done a, a really in-depth dive on because the Samantha moves forward in Red Book. I've done a real deep dive into bilocating, translocating and what um, you might know as remote viewing. And and that gets have you, you've heard of that term before, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've done a deep dive into remote viewing and I look at that and I think this isn't a special skill set. This isn't something this isn't something that um, a lot of people don't know about it. A lot of people don't do it. 
but it is possible, I feel, for any reasonably functioning functioning human being to accomplish. Right. It may seem supernatural or malarkey to some or hocus pocus, but when you look at the steps to take in order to remote view, this is something um, this is something that has met with a lot of success to the fact to the tune of I think twenty two million dollars is what the CIA put into it for a number of years. You know, they had a budget for that and they did have some success stories. The Russians did it too. And there has to be there has to be some uh, efficacy to that or else they wouldn't have stayed at it for so long. No, and that's such a great point with the remote viewing. And as you said, a lot would just on the surface go, well, that's a bunch of like psychic malarkey BS. But to be honest with you, it is not. And like you said, any normal capacity, uh, gray mattered human being can teach themselves to do this. Now, there are some that are better at it than others, right? Or it might take them True. five more years to get to where someone might do it in one. But that is something that a lot of people would call paranormal or oh that's some really truly weird shit and i'm not barking up that tree but when you really read about it like you said cia poured millions of dollars into this program because it was in fact legit so you so obviously you did a lot of research for for redbird which obviously <laughs> also stems from things that you had you know this fire lit from going through this stuff when you were younger now I, and I know that we're all going to let you go soon, I promise. But if we could just touch on this one thing before we go, is you brought up the fact that you are RH negative. Now, you've already said that you've, you are aware of what goes on with some of the claims, and some are on the low spectrum of kind of what some would call weird, and then there's the really high spectrum of strange high strangeness attached to RH negative blood. I mean, Nick Redfern even wrote an entire book on that stuff. Uh, I don't know if oh, you see, and I don't, if you knew that, but now I know. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, you might find that kind of interesting, and I should get him on to talk about that. But I've had a few people on that they have a whole bunch of strangeness going on. It might be spread out over their whole lives, and come to find out, they're Rh negative. Is it tied in? Who knows? But it's at least something to look into. I mean, from what you looked at for Rh negative, though. Do you feel it has any tie into the things that you've experienced or that's just a happenstance? I think I'm in the middle of answering that question. I don't know yet. So one of the things I, I tell my husband is I, you know, I, I need you to, if I go down the rabbit hole, you need to keep hold of my ankles. Okay. Because in order to <laughs> yeah. really research this stuff in depth, you have to have somebody there that can pull you back out of the rabbit hole. And this is what happened to um, a military guy who was with the CIA uh, uh, program uh, for the um, remote viewing program. And he wound up in a psychiatric hospital and he, he tells his story, but he wound up in a psychiatric hospital and he was completely discredited and burned from the CIA. His career was over and he was actually had been in the military and was on his way. He, you know, he was really, kind of touted as, well, this guy's going to be a general. Um, and he had a, he had a talk with a native American who was also working with him on this project. And he asked the guy, he said, how, how did you come out of this? Okay. And he said, I don't have your Western viewpoint. I'm, mm. I'm native American. He said, I'm open. And I realize the connection that we have to our universe. And they actually took him, the Native Americans took him up into Wisconsin and they did a, they, they almost did a shaman ritual type of, to heal him. And they, he, and he also added, this Native American also added, when you go down the rabbit hole, you have to remember to come out again. And that's what I always keep in mind is I'm here for a reason. I'm a sentient being, a human being for a reason. Um, you know, there's nothing... There, there's nothing special about us and there's everything special about us. So when I say that, um, what I mean is, and I just told my husband this the other day and he laughed and it's like, I still have bodily functions. I can still bleed. I'm still going to die. I was born into this world. And as much as I may want to think I'm special, I'm not. We have the skill set. And that's in, in with the RH negative blood. Do I think there's something there? Possibly. Um, I, I do. And, and I've talked to other people and I, 
I've started asking that question when I interview them, what's your blood type? And inevitably, the wilder stories I hear always have, I'm Rh negative. And mm. I don't know if you've seen this on the COVID-19 studies where they have said, you know, people with O negative blood are have about um, an 18% less susceptibility. We're not immune from COVID. I am not saying that. But the studies that I've read have shown that we're about 18% less likely to contract. Mm. Um, we have a resistance to it. Um, we have a higher resistance. And, uh, and, I, and then I started looking for Rh negative, but I didn't see that. And when you look at only 5% of the global population has an Rh negative blood type. It's very rare. Um, and, we, and if you're O negative and Rh negative, you are a universal blood donor but people, you cannot take other people's blood unless it's an O negative, RH negative person, which I find really mm, weird. That's very strange. Yeah. Yeah. So this was the other thing. This was another weird thing that happened. So when I was pregnant with my first child, I went in and, you know, and the doctor tested me and he's shaking his head. And he said, in my 30 year career as an obstetrician, I have never seen a woman come in here with RH negative blood and I had to go on a government registry. I, I did. He had to report it. I had to fill out some paper and I was only like 18 years old and I had to fill out some paper and then he, and then he uh, had to give me a shot of Rogam because if you're RH negative female who's pregnant, your antibodies can a actually cross that placental barrier and attack your unborn child. What? And I, yes. I didn't know about that. Never yeah. heard that. Yes. So it's called Rogam, and they do it so that you can give birth to your child without blindness, deafness, or oh. potentially a miscarriage and death. Oh my God. I've heard a lot of different things with RH negative. Never heard about that. So you had to fill out paperwork. I did. Yeah, at 18, I had to fill out And I had to carry a card at the time. And I wish I still had it, but, you know, I was... Uh, I wasn't always real responsible when I was 18. <laughs> I, I since long lost that card. But yeah, they used to make you carry a little card around and it would say, I am arch negative and it had your name on it and it had the little red, you know, cross on it. And, and it was pretty, pretty wild. B.A., you're obviously an alien hybrid. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I feel very fortunate to be talking to you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but, Okay, so swinging back then real quick just to the remote viewing because I just it crossed my mind because I said how some people when they start to remote view, they just pick it up really quickly and they're really good at it. Uh, oh, and for everybody out there, a good movie to watch is, has been the great Ben Kingsley in it and it's called uh, uh, Suspect Zero. It's a dark movie. It's got a lot of dark stuff in it, but it's a great example of what a great remote viewer is capable of uh, and maybe how hard it would be to be good at such a thing i wonder if people that are rh negative would make for better remote viewers than most other people i wonder if that ties in at all that's a great question i don't know you got to get on that and see i'm just yeah <laughs> you're like i have enough to do i'm writing books and things all right so last question ba and then i'll let you go thank you so much for your time today uh do you have any activity now any weird stuff going on in the last few years uh, well, you, the two of us talked about that. So the helicopter was hovering over the house, which I videotaped mm -hmm. for you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> which was kind of, uh, yeah, I'm like, here they are again. And then it's <laughs> funny because I went back to 2015 and I found another one. And I was like, what the hell? Oh. Just, resources, just come talk to me. <laughs> I'm right them. here. Yeah, you don't have to creep around. I'll talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, I can't think of any crimes I might have committed. <laughs> so. Nothing you can remember right now anyway, right? I mean, <laughs> that's that's so, the whole I'm thing, though. Anything. You filled out that paperwork but way back when you were 18, and now you're, yeah, on, right? you're on the short list, <laughs> man. <laughs> They're like, you can move wherever you want, BA. We're going to find you. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Well, you are a joy to talk to. And uh, I mean, part of that is because you're you're so just well researched on all these things that you're obviously very interested in and for personal reasons. So, again, thank you so much for coming on and just, you know, let everybody know where to find you and, and your work. 
Sure. So you could visit, I have short stories and you can visit our website, which is www.bacrisp.com. And um, there is a link to Redbook there through Amazon. We're also available at um, Dine. I don't know how far your show goes, um, Shannon, if it goes all over the world, but we're in Barnes and Noble, we're in Amazon, we're in Dynamox in Australia, we're in Blackwells in the UK. So it's been a pretty exciting run so far, and the book is has been well received so far, and I'm I'm happy about that. Um, you know, I didn't write it to become rich or famous. I wrote it for to be cathartic and to mm-hmm. potentially answer some mm-hmm. questions for myself and try to come to terms with some of the things that. Um, I experienced as a foster kid. It really does help, doesn't it? Just to get it out there. Whether it's it's in the verbal form or the written form, there is something extremely therapeutic about it. Mm-hmm. And it's been a, and I, it's it's just been a wonderful ride, and I'm not done yet. So the second book will be going to the editor at the end of the month, um, and uh, there will probably be um, uh, the Quanta Chronicles will probably be a three book series. And then I've already started another novel um, about an Oxford based archeologist who loses uh, a child up in Peru in the caves. Um, Yeah. And that was the other thing I forgot to mention to you too. So that there were the cave systems in Ohio and a lot of people don't know those exist. And I found another story about how these people back in the 1800s were taken down into this cave and they saw all these chalices and gems and, skeletons and weird stuff and and then that was and that was very close to plum hook uh, uh plum brook as well uh, ba have you ever read the descent i don't know if you've ever heard me yak on about that book but it's basically my favorite book by jeff long but that's all about uh the subterranean beneath our feet and what might be inhabiting it so really terrifying it i have never wanted to go in caves less after reading that book yeah, I actually think I did, and it was based. I did you mention that in your in your latest documentary? Did you talk about that or not? Um, I, I may have taken it from another documentary, I but know. I do. Have, I just started it with the underground stuff because I wanted to learn about you know the underground alleged underground cave systems and and um, things like that. And I was just learning about crypto terrestrials last night. So, mm-hmm. that, yeah. Yeah, the idea of that stuff. Uh, I'm not a fan of, uh, you know, small, dark places, so I wouldn't be a caver anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, after reading books like that, and uh, um, it's a it's a big old, like, nope, no, it's on no list. Um, but I'm fascinated by the idea of that. And, yeah, crypto terrestrials and things like that. You're just going, well, could be. You never know. Uh, stranger right. things have happened, especially with all the things that I cover on my show and the people I get to talk to, I'm like, ah, nothing is, nothing's crazy. I don't, I wouldn't call anybody crazy for claiming that they've seen what they've seen, especially when it changes their life and heaven forbid, it changes it in a really bad way. And we have people that don't go in the woods anymore, you know, uh, because of what they've seen. But, um, right. and I, I always wonder too, if people that hear voices or see things, maybe they're a little more tuned in or dialed in than we are. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, with your blue light being, I mean, you know, what do you even classify that under? Is it under more like the ghost haunting type stuff? Or is that right. a, under just, I mean, what where, what box is can it, you put that in? Is, an, is it an astral body? Is, right. it a, is it a ghost? Is it um, another being? Is it a cloaking de- Is it some sort of high-tech military cloak device where they're testing it on unsuspecting teenage girls? <laughs> right. Know. Could be a hologram. Could have been you. Could have been you standing there. Because you. I mean, let's face it. We'll, we'll. You know, we can. The conjecture of the RH negative, and oh, you have powers, BA, that you didn't even know that you had, and you were projecting yourself into that doorway. So, there's just so many different yeah. cave systems we can go down when it comes to something right. like I, that. But it I is interesting to... that you felt you felt at peace with that. It didn't freak you out at all. Which, in all rights, it probably should have, but it didn't. Not that one. That was actually pretty peaceful. But I do have to ask you, Shannon, you had mentioned earlier in the show that you saw um, shadow figures. Where was that? So that was in uh, in Utah, in Duck Creek, Utah, where okay. to this day, a lot of people from Vegas, because it's only like a five hour drive, they okay. go up there to cool down and everything. And uh, I was 
I was 12, same age as you when you saw the white Bigfoot. And I was on my four-wheeler. My dad was down in town. So I was being a naughty kid and didn't have my helmet on. And you've ridden snowmobiles and stuff. So you know that if you've got those damn goggles on, you can't see a goddamn thing and and set up what's in front of you. So that's why it's important to know that I didn't have those on. But it was middle of the day. And I was hanging back because my brother and stepbrother were riding in front of me. And the cabins up there are set up pretty much on a straight grid system, all dirt roads. So you could kind of haul ass if if you were, you know, a stupid kid and you wanted to do so. And we were. And so I'm hanging back and I looked off into the into the woods there. It's not dense woods. It's not like Ohio where you have all that thorny, thick ground brush and all that crap that's out there. It was real clear ground and then just aspen trees. But they're again, it's not dense. So I look over and there was four pitch black shadow figures running in the woods, uh, paralleling me, keeping up with me, by the way. And the weirdest thing was, is they're like pumping their arms and legs, but they weren't, I always say it's hard to describe because they weren't running. It's not like I saw them running through the trees or anything. It's just they didn't have to dodge them or, you know, move over anything over the ground. They just were making the motion that they were making. And I watched them for like a five count. And then, of course, I'm still riding my four have to check the path in front of me. I do so. I look back and they're just gone. But the the five seconds like just changed everything for me, you know, and that's why I brought up the the thing that my dad said and what your husband said. I go back and I'm like, hey, dad, just saw some really weird stuff in the woods. <laughs> really weird <laughs> and he's like oh this he's ex-military and he's like oh those are just military guys they're they were just doing exercises you know and i'm like going dad oh. no no it's not a you know they weren't people it was like the black is black and still darker than that you know like no light could find them and this is like middle of the day no clouds it's summertime we're out there at my dad's cabin hanging out and no light could touch these things nothing and I would say I'm lucky that I I think I'm lucky. I think I would have processed it very differently. But they, none of them like interacted with me. Or no waves or I, if they had faces, if they turned, I don't know. But, you know, I didn't get the hint that they even knew that I was there. It's like I just caught a glitch in the matrix or something for those five yeah. seconds, you know. Or maybe I, I wasn't supposed to see what I saw, but I did. And yeah, yeah it just takes a few seconds and your whole life is like, oh, well, the world has other things in it that maybe I didn't even, it would never have crossed my mind that even existed, you know? Mm-hmm. Or, or we're aligned with other worlds according to quantum physics, yeah. which, you know, has been proven out in some theories. But, and it's, and that's where I go back to, I don't think it's magic necessarily, or even, you know, we call it supernatural because we don't know what it is, but maybe there's a logical explanation for it. You know, just things that we are just not advanced enough to yet know. Um, as far as the remote viewing, to tie that back in, because if if you can teach yourself, and anybody can, just look it up, guys, if you don't believe us. You can teach yourself to remote view. You, you may not be super great at it, or you might be friggin' awesome at it. But what if, if you can unlock that part of your brain to do that, to see a location that while you're sitting in your living room, you can see a location thousands of miles away. What else could we really do? Or what else is just shut off right now? You know? And I'll say, so I was testing that. And I remember one time I I was trying to remote view. And I wound up, it, it was like the early 70s. And I'm going down these stairs toward this woman. And she's got like this short hair. It was a bad haircut. And she was wearing, she was sitting by a river. And her name, and I remember I just walked up to her and she had a yellow pad and I said, Hey Ruth. And she was so shocked. And then I just kept walking and I have no idea where I was, but I remember there was a river and I think there was a bridge in the distance and Ruth, I, I, for some reason I felt like she was a government worker and it was just a, a weird kind of thing. So if anybody knows anything about that, (laughs) wow. You yeah, knew her name. I did know her name. It was weird. I just knew her, knew her as Ruth, and I just walked down the stairs. I was coming toward her, and she stopped writing, and she's looking at me like, what the fuck? <laughs> and I go, 
Hi, Ruth. And then, oh, and then I said, yes, I, re- I remote viewed the remote viewer. And I kept oh. walking. <laughs> <laughs> Peace out, Ruth. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's strange. I love stuff like that. I love, love, love stuff like that. It's just so freaking weird. Like, how do you even begin to explain that? Yeah, you can't. You can't. Who knows? And that's why I'm like, I have no idea where it was. All I know is there was a oh. river and she was sitting on some low wall by, <laughs> and there was a river behind her. And I think I remember a bridge to the left and I had to come downstairs to approach her and I could go around her and keep continue on. But, but it was just really kind of a weird, I, it's just one thing I, I remember. Um, and then there's, well, no, it's not just one thing. There's lots of things, but that's another episode. <laughs> We really should have another one, especially if you start to, you know, because obviously you're writing about things that not only are you interested in, but that you want to research, like you said, like this whole cave thing. So seeing as how I am terrified and fascinated by caves, I would love to have you back on, you know, as far as things that you find out, or obviously, if you have more stories, I would love to hear them. I know that everyone else will too. But uh, a million thanks for doing this today, B.A. Yeah, well, I had a wild thing happen. So I worked for a client. I've never met him in person. And he said, have you ever gone to Sedona? And I said, no, I've never been there. And he said, well, um, I have a property management company, and we'd like to loan you a house for your help during COVID with some of the research you did for us. And um, so I'm excited about that. So I don't know how close that is to you, but I'm assuming if you're in Vegas, that's probably pretty far away. Sedona. Sedona's one of, well, you know, we went there for on the trail of, and I had never been there. Place is insane, amazing. Yeah, if I can make it out there somehow, I will. Right. I even, I told my husband, I said, that is the freakiest thing. He like called out of the blue and said, you know, we'd like to offer you this. Well, BA, thank you so much. And if any, especially today, after we've spoken about this, if you you see any of those, uh, those black birds flying above you, let me know, please. I will. All right. You take care, Shannon. And thank you so much uh, for the opportunity and talking with you. I feel like we could sit around a campfire and drink and we talk all night we long. We definitely it could. I would grab the whiskey and whatever you like to drink and we'd oh, have at it. Yes. Lady right there. <laughs> um, cheers to that. <laughs> all right. All right BA, thank you so much. Thanks, Shannon. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, I'm so-and-so. I was given this name by my parents. I've been to such and such a college. I've done these things in my profession. I produce a little bar. Buddha says, forget it. There's nothing. That's some of the story. That's all gone. That's all past. I want to see the real you you are now. But nobody knows who that is. Because we don't uh, know ourselves except through listening to our echoes and consulting our memories. But then there's a real evil, and that again leads us back to this question. Uh, who are you? That is the real evil. We shall see how they play with this exam by the cohorts to get you to come out of your shell and find out who you really are.
suddenly become somebody different, living somewhere else. They will say reincarnation means this, that if you sitting here now are really convinced that you're the same person who walked in at the door half an hour ago, you're being reincarnated. If you are liberated, you understand that you're not. The past doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. There is only the present. That's the only real you that there is. The Zen master Dogen put it in this way. He said, Spring does not become the summer. First there is summer, and then there is spring. Straight, 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 straight. 